Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns, the podcast where we usually dissect films and then pitch an idea for a sequel. However, this week is a little bit different as we're taking on the Oscars. So we will be reviewing and discussing all nine nominees for Best Picture, and we'll have a little look at some of the other categories as well. If you're new to the podcast, then do please visit our website, dimreturns.com, where you can access all our old episodes, including our Oscars special from last year. This episode contains fairly minor spoilers for Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Lady Bird, and The Post, as well as very, very major plot spoilers for Get Out, Phantom Thread, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Enjoy! Oh, actually, hang on a sec. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly um, go away from my microphone for a second because I need to collect my... Uh... My post. No, my, no, my dumbbells, my weights. I often... <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> well, well, I mean, you could have given me a million guesses and that's not what I would have gone for. So now it's just good to do a little bit of, you know, working out. Pump some <laughs> iron while we uh, talk about the film. I don't know what's so funny about that. <laughs> just, I can just imagine you, you're just chatting away, pumping iron. <laughs> 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 oh, God, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't, um... I didn't get how funny that was till I spelled it out just then, but yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, we're ready. Yes, yes. The glitz and glamour of the awards season is on us. I'm wearing my best tuxedo. I know Calvin is because he wears it for all his Bond videos. Sol, you probably haven't got one because you're a I'm scummy, my dressing scummy gown. northerner. Yeah, there you go. You, you're, you're the person who doesn't turn up to the awards ceremony and sends a video message. Is, um, is your dressing gown black? God, no. Oh, oh dear. Oh, mm. sorry, you, Ben. You um, hate women. Yeah. You bastard. <laughs> so, shall we get on with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Calvin. I'm Sol. Yes, uh, so uh, I'm Alan. Hello. Uh, we're here to discuss the Oscars 2018. And to do so, uh, well, in fact, before that, we did do this last year. So this is now an official annual celebration of the Oscars, mm. even though I don't really like them. Celebration. Uh, commemoration. <laughs> commiseration. Examination. An ex- Ooh, yes. Very Ooh, good. There we go. Uh, okay, so this is our dissection of the Oscar films. We watch all the Best Picture nominations, and we're going to discuss them all. It's nine this year. Obviously, we're not going to go into too much detail, because we'll be here forever. Uh, some of them aren't even released in this country yet, but somehow we've managed to... I think, uh, they, I think <laughs> because, they're all out now. Uh, we were all, we, we're all members of the Academy, so we get screeners. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I watched almost all of these completely legally this time. Really? With advanced screenings and things. There was a couple I never got a chance to see, but um, I googled them and then like I just found them online. Like, proper <laughs> DVD quality and everything. I don't know why anyone ever goes to the cinema or pays for DVDs. I mean, it was it was mm. free. Do you know about this? Because, because, <laughs> because people work very hard to make these things, and if we don't go and pay and... Well, they shouldn't put them out online team. for free, then. I mean, <laughs> what sort of marketing strategy is that? There, there's some films on this list that I would argue... Don't come across as if anyone worked very hard on them at all. So. <laughs> Ooh, okay. attempting tease of what's to come. Mm. <laughs> so. No, you know what? Last year, I made a big song and dance about how shit a selection of nominations it was and how much of a shit year it was for the Oscars. This year, I think it's back to a conventional standard and I more or less enjoyed uh, the vast majority mm. of what I saw this time round. Um I always think the no- I like looking back at the nominations. I think it represents what the Academy are trying to show themselves as, and they've really done well this year. There's a black one, a gay one. There's at least four female leads. I mean, they're they're doing everything they can at the moment. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to hit them one at a time. Uh, yeah. What are we doing? Are we going to go random, or do you have a particular order you're keen on? Shall we do alphabetical, like the Academy itself? I'm I'm up for that, Alan. I'm not bothered really. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> no, no. Right. But it means we get to start with "Call Me by Your Name." So, mm. um, I'll go first then on this one. 
I, as, I, as, a, as a representative of the gays. Yeah, yes, yes. I have authority on this, <laughs> on this subject. But I think I'm probably the only one out of the three of us that has actually read the book. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I read the book and finished it just the day before I actually went to see this at the cinema. So the book was very fresh in my mind. I absolutely loved the book. It was just a lovely meandering, admittedly, but a lovely... I think if you've ever sort of been young and in love and you have that obsessive uh, quality where you're analysing someone else and all their movements to relate back to you and it's like, oh, they've put their arm there, that must mean that they are into me or oh, no, he mm. looked at me for a second less than he did yesterday, that must mean that mm. he's completely uh, fallen out of love with me and all that. It was really, really lovely read and I was thoroughly disappointed with the film. I, mm. They omitted a lot from the book that I think will get on to maybe in our discussion later on. Yeah. But one of the main things that I was missing from the book is that the book is written from the perspective of the the lad Elio, is it? Elio? Elio, yeah. Elio. It's written from his perspective years on, so he's sort of reminiscing and right. looking back. And there okay. are a few short passages at the end. It's not a big part of the book, but they jump sort of like Five years in the future, they had a phone conversation. Then ten years in the future, they actually met. And then twenty years in the future, they went for a drink together and talked about the whole experience together. And I can understand why something like that wouldn't be in the film. But I I kind of need that to contextualise the main story. Moonlight. that Everyone would just be going, oh, it's Moonlight again. Oh, qu- quite possibly, yeah. Because mm. at the moment, the film is just... A young lad falls in love with a slightly older guy. They have a nice romance, which is all l- lovely mm. shot and all that. And then he dumps him and he cries. And that's it. I think I agree with you for the most part there. I think we all look at this film and we can relate to it. Like, oh God, yeah, I was a teenager once and all that. Mm. Um, but- I'm sure you fucked your fair share of <laughs> Older men. <laughs> <laughs> I did fuck an nectarine every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Whatever it was. No, it must have been apricot. They were going on about apricots all the time. It was a peach. Oh, was, was it? oh peach. And it really pear. annoyed me. In the book, peach, in the book, pear. he eats the whole thing. In the <laughs> film, he just sort of like, he just has a little nibble and that's it. But it, it, it does, it strikes me as one of those books that it's like, oh, you could never film this book because it's, mm. cause it's a bit like, because with novels, you can be a bit more, um, I was going to say outlandish, but ultimately more real, I think, than film. Mm. There's always this sort of veneer of, well, Hollywood, I suppose, but obviously this isn't really a Hollywood film. Mm. Um, I, I enjoyed the film. I, I, you know I like films where nothing much happens, but this was taking that a bit far for me. It would have been nice to have a bit of plot or really? at least a little bit of conflict <laughs> or something. It was just like, yeah, they, they get on, they get it together, he has to go. A teenage, you know, a seventeen-year-old isn't very emotionally well set up to deal with that sort of thing, and mm. so he's a bit upset. He'll be over it in six months. It's like, yeah, it's not. Nice, but it, I like the feel of it. I like the atmosphere of the whole thing. Um, I like the boy's acting was fantastic. Mm. Um, mm. And think he he has been nominated for best actor. I think that's very deserved. Yeah, yeah. He probably should win, but I think Gary Oldman will. Mm. Um, um, I, it it really needed to be half an hour shorter for to to justify the meandering nature of it. And it, there just was not, not not enough new or original about it. Like every Italian film I've ever seen is like a, <laughs> about a coming of age, like an adolescent falling in love for the first time. And so it was just a little bit kind of lacking in something mm. special, but mm. very well filmed and really nicely put together. So I did enjoy it. The um, fact that the fact that it was a you know a bit gay doesn't make any difference. <laughs> like, I think that's that's like obviously a big selling point. Um, mm. And fair enough, it, it, it's a representation of that. But I don't think it's any different. I think if that had been an older woman, oh, no, no, I don't think it would have made any difference. Or mm. I think if it had been a young girl and older man, you probably couldn't do that now. But ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I don't think it would have been the same story. Um, mm. Jeremy Irons has done that uh, as the older man. I've, I've definitely seen that film once or twice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that. To be honest. Um... We're off to a very un- hmm. uninteresting start, I suppose. Because, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was kind of solid, average Oscar fare. It was a bit slow for its own good and a bit meandering. But at the same time, uh, none of the individual scenes bored me, if that makes sense. Like, hmm. I was able to kind of appreciate all of it happening. And um, I find it interesting what you said about the book, Calvin. Because I, based on what I've seen, I don't 
feel like I would want it contextualised. I think that would make Mm. it a very different film, so I can see how you would want that from it, if that's what you were expecting. But Mm. for me, that final moment of the film was incredibly powerful, like, very affecting, I thought, and it, it really kind of brought the film together and made me believe it. Film. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to see that as a quick add-on scene. Uh, it's like yeah, you, either, yeah. you either develop that and investigate that whole story and make it part of it, or don't. I believe that's what the director wants to do. He said that he envisions this story going on for another like five films. I did see that they've yeah, been I, yeah. marked up for a sequel. I was thinking, mm, I don't think that's what it needs. Yeah, <laughs> mm, yeah, I, I can't. <laughs> don't I just feel like I've got what I wanted yeah. to out of this story. I feel like they've said what they have to say. Yeah, I can't yeah. really. Just a quick question, Calvin. Where did it uh, rate on your wankometer? Oh, very low. <laughs> very, very low, was it? I thought there was <laughs> more explicit um, stuff with e- uh, Elio and uh, his girlfriend for a scene. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's having sex with her. I felt like that was more explicit than they did else do. Else. They did do something a classic, which I haven't seen for ages. Where they, they people start getting it on, and the camera just slowly pans away. Yeah, to the, to the wall. <laughs> I haven't seen that for years. I, that was yeah. quite nostalgic. Um, but yeah, I do. F- I mean, there was a lot of kind of well, sort of semi nudity. Well, but it didn't really get dirty, did it? It was a bit no. disappointing. In there. The impression I got from the film was less that it was about a very, like, fetishistic kid and more that it was just about that period in life when you will fuck anything, (laughs) thinking, like, oh, that might be a bit like sex and you'll put your dick in anything. Like, oh, okay, that's nearly... Yeah, I thought that as well, especially with the fact that, you know, he has his first lady love at the same time. Exactly, um, yeah. And all that. It's like, it didn't feel like... This felt more like an exploration than... Yeah. Particularly with he was gay and... Mm. I think the connection he made to this older man was, you got that feeling from the film that they did like each other. They got on and they kind of had similar mm. feelings about things. And, and so like, I don't think, I, I don't think that really came across in the film because it, I would have liked to see more of that. I don't know if that was in the book, like actually mm. like a genuine emotional connection. Yeah. It, the impression I got in the film really was that it was kind of just like very hormonally driven and maybe not the most authentic love in the world. And then near the end, it kind of seemed like it wanted you to believe that it was this romance. Mm. So I, I yeah. yeah. And you get that a lot more a, in the book. Right. Of course. Mm. Oh, mm. I, t- I've, I've, I just remembered a bit. The, the guy who played the dad, Oh yeah, Michael who, who are, Stuhl, something. Stuhlberger, yeah. Um, yes. Good actor, you see him in lots of things. And um, he, uh, the, there's there's a scene right near the end where he gets a chance to really shine, where he kind of just gives his son a little bit of mm. parental advice. I really like that scene. Absolutely, I thought it just yeah. the acting was really nice. Lovely, I like yeah. I, I like the kid all the way through. Everything was really minimalist, mm. and he just sort of like cried a lot. And um, yeah. yeah, the acting, I, I'm really, I was really on board with it. Mm. So. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, should we do ratings yeah. out of ten and then move on to the next? Yeah, let's let's do that. Okay, uh, mine would be a six. Mm. I think that mm. probably reflects your greater disappointment because you've read the book. Um, Certainly, yeah. I gave it a seven. Mm. Mm. I also give it a seven. Mm. Siete. <laughs> um, so next up is a uh, darkest hour. Mm. Okay. Uh, so. I've been relatively upbeat about these films. I quite liked pretty much everything. Uh, I fucking hated this film. And it's not that. It's not that bad. But I posted a, a Facebook status after I saw it because I was so frustrated, and I, I hid you both from it so you wouldn't see it. So I'm just going to read that out because it sums <laughs> up my opinions. Um. People complain about superhero movies for being the same thing over and over again, but make the 50 millionth Churchill biopic and it's a guaranteed (laughs) Best Picture nomination. Darkest Hour can go fuck itself. Joe Wright is a hack, and if Gary Oldman wins the Oscar, then where are the Oscars for John Colshaw, Alistair McGowan, and Rory Bremner? Yeah, he does the voice well. How about doing some acting? Hashtag Oscars so shite. I was fuming. (laughs) Hmm. It's a very uh, negative statement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. oh, it's just it's just the most mediocre film that has no place anywhere near an award ceremony. It's the most transparent <laughs> attempt at credibility. I don't think Joe Wright is particularly worth anything. The best thing he's ever made is an episode of Black Mirror, which was you know off the basis of a brilliant script that it ended up being good. How do you guys feel about it? 
I think I rallied against it along similar lines, but probably less uh, venomously. Uh, like <laughs> I, I think it's it reminded me a lot of uh, the Iron Lady from a few years ago, where it felt like God, this film just exists because that actor is in that role, and we're just <laughs> yeah. going to showcase that actor and give them all these amazing scenes, and mm. yeah, they're going to get the Oscar. It was just very dull. It was if it wasn't for that performance and the. Um, how it was shot, it mm. could just have been like a two-hour ITV movie, TV. Mm. Um, that, that, yeah, it felt like TV. So much yeah. of it felt like TV drama. Yeah. I do agree with some of the things you've said. Um, I, I do, my, my major problem with this film was that it didn't tell me anything I haven't seen before. It didn't tell me, you know, this is, mm. and this is a real, it's supposed to be a really intimate portrayal. So where is that intimate detail that I haven't seen before. Well, it's, it's the time he walks out of the bath naked. That's the <laughs> intimate moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I like that, but I did I did appreciate that it wasn't a straightforward hagiography. It was, you know, it did show him as a bit of a conflicted personality and that he was a bit mental, um, <laughs> which I think is necessary. I would like to see a real Watson and all kind of Churchill story. Yeah. <clears throat> because he was not, <laughs> he was not liked until like 1939. <laughs> nobody nobody yeah. liked him. Um, so it would have been uh, interesting to see like a full biopic of him and, and, mm. and sort of focus on these earlier days when everybody hated I was him. really hoping this was going to be that <laughs> and it just mm-hmm. wasn't at all. Yeah. But I think setting it over just a three week period gives you a very intense kind of look at a character. Mm. I like that idea. Gary Oldman in the film. Yeah, it's a really good performance. I understand what you guys are saying there. It's Yeah, it's a really good impression. And they put a lot of makeup on him. Is that enough? Okay. I think it is a good performance, though. I think you can't argue yeah. with his ability. It's about as good a performance as anyone could have given in this film with this script. I'll, I'll give him that. Like, obviously some conflict does come in eventually. It takes him a while to get to it, but... There's not much in the way of a beginning, middle, and ending, is there? It really no. just feels like, and then this happened, and then this happened. But it the, it covers the the story it's covering is from him becoming a prime minister and kind of everyone's reluctant about it to him uh, winning uh, popular approval, and and that only happens through pure luck. <laughs> it's not the, like I say he makes these really he makes these really big just... calls and he falls on the right side of mm. history, and that literally is why he's remembered as one of the greatest heroes of, of yeah. British history. I don't want to take anything away. I'm sure he, and as a, as a wartime leader, it seemed to be that was the kind of attitude that was required, mm. um, a more bombastic dictatorial position. Yeah. But it could very easily have gone tits up. Yeah, and, and as you say, it's 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 different in a time of war, um, as the country like decided by pretty much immediately kicking him out of office once the war was over. Um, I w- yeah, exactly. I will say this though: the the scene with him on the on the tube where he talks to the people was probably mm. the the cringiest thing oh, in the entire, yeah. God, the entire I film. Forgot about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. God, yeah. And I was really, I really did like the film, and that was re- that was scene was just like, ugh, this is this is bad. Is it w- one person on the tube says something along the lines of, "We can't let the fascists win," or something. <laughs> like We're that. behind you, Mister Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If if I was writing a parody of a Churchill biopic, it wouldn't be far off that scene. Honestly, it, <laughs> yeah. Um. I've got to disagree with one thing you said. Completely disagree. I think Joe Wright is one of the best directors working at the moment. Oh, really? It, on, on, no, a, on a cinematic name a good level. Joe Wright film. The, the Darkest Hour. <laughs> Other than this. Atonement. Atonement I think, shit. I think all his films are good. It's Atonement the only time shit. I've ever seen... They're the only ones I've seen. His, 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 films, <laughs> his films are the only time Kira Knightley's ever been acceptable as an actor. Well, she wasn't any good in Atonement. Hannah was awful. I mean, it's 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 snazzy. He's good at putting together like music video type visuals in his no, films. Come but... on. No, come on, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not just a, a visual Snyder. thing. He is. I'm not saying he. No, no. I'm not saying he's got a great range because he seems to make the same film <laughs> sets in the forties all the time. In Darkest Hour, it's the visuals are just so cinematic, and I think that's what I'm talking about. It, it really feels like. Old, much older cinema. Like I'm talking, there's there's stuff in Darkest Hour that goes back to like Soviet films, silent films, like Eisenstein montage theory mm. and stuff like that. And I I like that sort of stuff. And here it's balanced, where you get these little snippets of it, and it feels oh, like it adds to the like feel it. rather than it, 
doing it as a stylistic kind of, oh, we're going to make to a me, silent film. It's called The Artist. Oh, look, there's no one talking. Yeah, well, to me, it just felt like, oh, here's a 10 minute scene of people talking and it's shot like television. Shit, we need to justify all this money we've spent on the film. <laughs> oh, it's all right, just chuck in a quick, like, three minute, or not, no, like, 30 seconds of quick edits of, like, cool shots, and then we'll get back to just someone talking and it's not remotely interesting again. And it just, it didn't feel like a a coherent stylistic choice. It also didn't feel like one that fit the the film in any way to me, personally. It just felt very like, oh, I'll just emulate some stuff I've seen from the time here, and then we'll do, like, normal filmmaking there, and oh, I don't know. Didn't work for me. Didn't think much of it. Anyway, uh, ratings? Uh, hmm, I'm gonna go five? Oh. Eight. Ooh! Ooh. Well, I, I give it a six, actually. Cause what? Because I, I think it's a what? competently... Well, I think it's a competently made... I think it's a mediocre film. Oh! It has no place at the Oscars, and it's outrageous that it's been nominated over the likes of The Big Sick. So, mm. fuck you, Academy. Right, so, Call Me By Your Name, by the way, has an average 6.7 out of 10 from us. Hmm. And Darkest Hour has 6.4. I think Darkest Hour is by far and away the worst film nominated this year. How does it have 6.4 from three people? Doesn't make any sense. Because I round up. We've been over this. I round up. 6.33333. Yeah, so that's 6.3. Yeah. Wait, if you want to be a pessimist and you want to do math rules and you multiply and then you subtract them. You round round to the nearest Yeah, if it's 0.5, you round up. And if it's 0.4 and below, you round down. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Correct. Well, I don't adhere to that. I think it's bullshit, like this film. <laughs> and yet, give it six out of ten. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, okay. so talking of mediocre films, uh, Dunkirk is next. Well, oh. I mean, to say that, <laughs> I think Dunkirk's a vastly, vastly superior version of the same sort of thing being put on screen. Uh, I mean, yeah, Dunkirk, big letdown. <laughs> um, Christopher Nolan is brilliant, I think. Um, we're, we're at a stage in his career now where the backlash has begun, and I think Dunkirk is very much one of his weakest films to date. But I still think it's a very well-made, uh, technically very well-made film. And I think the end result for me was very similar to Gravity when that came out. It just felt like being sat in a ride at Universal Studios. It didn't feel like Mm. there was any emotional connection to anything. It didn't feel like I was being told a story. It just felt like I was being submerged in an experience for an hour and a half or however long it is. And taken on that level, I think it was a very good effort, but I'm never going to look at that sort of thing as as being as worthy as a a real film with like a narrative and stuff. So (laughs) that's that's me. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I. it's not that it was a bad film or anything, and it just left me cold, really. I don't think I got emotionally connected to anyone who was in it. Uh, the Maybe because of the multiple storylines and you're kind of dealing with many protagonists, so you don't sort of have a central person to follow. The non-linear storytelling seemed completely arbitrary as well. I said the exact same thing. That switching timeline, it felt like an arbitrary decision, but it felt like a reason, it felt like a decision just to help put a bit of dramatic tension in or dynam- dynamicity into a of quite a boring film. And the fact that the, the biggest kind of emotional impact that came from it was the death of a guy who mm. fell down the stairs. And I think in a war film, I don't know if that really makes any sense at all. <laughs> I don't know what I was supposed to think about that. Uh, and, and that seemed a weird choice. Um, it needed more focus. It needed to decide what it was trying to do or what it was about. Uh, and my other major complaint about it was that I just found the music really distracting <laughs> and completely inappropriate most of the time. And like it was desperately trying to crank up the tension when there wasn't any. Mm. I found it very overbearing and it was annoying me. But I think the fact that I started to find it almost suffocating was very much part of that experience. And I think it had the effect it was intended to do. Although it did very much take me out of it because it seemed like, oh, this music's such a fucking technical exercise for Hans Zimmer. Mm. He's he's playing with all these like sound techniques that don't necessarily make for good music, but like just, you know, music people can go, oh, very, very interesting. Mm. But yeah. 
Well, I, I sounds like I'm going to be the most positive one about it then. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think Sol nailed it, really, with saying it's, it feels like a ride or some kind of virtual reality experience. Mm. Uh, and the best I could equate to, because I know when people say, oh, it was like a video game. To be honest, this is the most video game-like film I think I've ever seen, in that you don't really get to know the characters very well, and it felt like I was in a level when I was watching it, like, mm. oh crap, they're on a boat, it's filling with water, how do they get out, what do they need to do, all this kind of stuff. But obviously it's a... Uh, you can't quite fall in love with a film where there is just no emotional connection mm. at all. Especially that main character, I can't remember the actor's name, because it's largely the younger lads, apart from Harry Styles, are mostly played by unknowns. Harry Styles um, is in it. Yeah, the... <laughs> Oh, did you? Um, are you making a joke or? No, no. I, mean, I've, I know who he is. He was in the One Directions, but um, <laughs> I don't know, um, but I didn't know he was an actor as well. I didn't know that's what he was doing. There. Well, he's well, not. He's, but he's, he's done he's this, dabbled. and yeah. I think he said like, actually, I don't really like it very much. So. He ends up on the train at the end with the main character. He's the he's the very good looking one. I was gonna say he's the one with the best hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was he the one who was a bit more cocky and he was like, oh, I can't yes. read it. They're gonna hate us. Oh, yeah, he's giving yeah, yeah. me a Newcastle Brown Ale. I'm happy again. <laughs> is it that one? Yes, yes. Actually, I did one. like that element of it where they were all well, well, that character. He, they were going back, like going, "Oh, they're going to be ashamed of us because we've failed the country." I'd never thought of it like that. Oh, um, because yeah, Dunkirk you know is I always actually... presented as like this, yeah, yeah, this heroic thing, which it, from a mm-hmm. national point of view, it is. But the fact mm-hmm. that they were coming away from there, oh, we've retreated, we we lost. Mm. I, I, I hadn't, I didn't put that together. So that I like that aspect of it. Yeah, I really enjoyed that scene. Overall, I really. It took me a while actually to understand that it was uh, like a, a, a non-linear timeline because I I didn't really quite understand what the title cards that were coming up with. It's like three days, three hours, mm. a week, or whatever it is. And then when I got that, I was kind of oh, this is. I actually quite liked that and how it all came together at the end. Uh, I was excited. I was exhilarated. I was on the edge of my seat through a lot of it. So it was an experience. It was very good. But yeah, overall, really enjoyed it. Cool. Ratings? I'm going to go eight. I'll go six. Seven from me. So that's Ooh. a seven overall. Oh, yes. our highest rated film yet. Ooh. And now, this is where discussion gets interesting. Get out. But if I get out, how will we talk about the film, Sol? Just fuck off, all right? <laughs> that's not the name of a film. That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is an interesting one because mm. it has no place at the Oscars. Um, it came yeah. out like not during Oscar season, which I suppose was true of Dunkirk as well. But it's one of and Call Me by Your Name actually. But it's it's one of these rare films that sneaks in that just came out as a normal film. It was very much this film that came out and then it was all anyone was talking about for a month, or at least it was all anyone in LA was yeah. talking about for a month. No, um, no. Yeah, here. I mean, it was like April last year as well. It's been a long time since it was released. Certainly that's when I saw it, April last year. Mm. I'm going to make a very bold prediction here. I think this is going to win Best Picture. Yeah, no, I'm, I completely agree. <laughs> I think it is. It's uh, it's it's far from the favourite. Um, I, I got very good odds, actually, on, on the bet I put on it. But I think this is going to be another Moonlight. I think the Academy's moving... You know, it's at a time where it's it's trying to honour films like this. All these younger, trendier people are voting now who will not turn their nose up at genre cinema. It, and, and I don't think there's a particularly strong, clear-cut winner for it to topple. I think votes mm. are going to be split. I agree with that. There's none of these films particularly jump out, do they? Mm. This one was a bit of a slow burn on me. It was like the... But but in a good way, I think the pacing of it was spot on because the way it kind of just unfolded in dramatically revealing things, I thought that worked really nicely. I was expecting a Night of the Living Dead ending, which I was a bit disappointed I didn't get. Um, that, that was the original a, ending. A good way though. to close it out. Really? It, 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 it like makes it. sense because it's setting up yeah. for that. And it yeah, was, and it's yeah. like the obvious ending. Perhaps it's too obvious. Maybe that's why they didn't do it. They just, well, yeah. They, I think they just did that. They did that thing of, oh, we've we've put you through so much. Let's just have a happy ending for fuck's sake. And I think it yeah. works either way because because they it's so ob- like they set up that that's what they're doing with it. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. It feels like you go, you take they take it right up to that point, and then they go, oh, no, no, yeah. it's not. Which is you know fair enough. Uh, I did enjoy it. I thought the acting was really good. It, it, it didn't blow me away, 
And mm. I feel like I'm supposed to find a deeper meaning here, some sort of analogy for racism, <laughs> which I didn't get. And I'm not quite sure what, if it was trying to say something else and I just didn't get it, mm. or if it was just, you know, it's written by a black person, so he's, he's putting a slightly different perspective on it. And so we, ha- and I like that. I like that there was all this kind of casual racism that he's just like, for fuck's sake, yeah, okay, ask me about something about black people. Mm. Um, which I think is, that's kind of what racism is all about now, isn't it? Like, yeah. fo- rather than focusing on people who actually uh, stand out racist, it's, it's these culturally entrenched ideas. Obviously, the racing comes into it later on, but I, I don't feel like there was a deeper meaning there. And I, I don't know if you can explain it to me if there is one. You know, a, a white people in a black person's body, and that, like, I don't know quite what it was saying. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I went into this. I was really excited because it was a you know it's a horror film getting all this buzz, um, and I I love my horror. And um, Jordan Peele is a, a sketch comedian uh, mm-hmm. primarily prior to this. Who you know again that makes me think, oh great, I, you know I I like comedy, <laughs> um, and I like it when comedic people turn around and just say nah fuck it i'm doing something serious and yeah i mean i i do really enjoy the film i think it's good uh i do kind of feel similarly to you i think i don't quite get what the hype is about i think there's probably an element of not being part of america we're looking at it objectively perhaps um and then at the risk of sounding very snobby i think there's an element of being a more than a casual film watcher so i've seen this sort of stuff done before it's not the most mind-blowing incredibly innovative film in the world and obviously it finds like fresh spins to put on it and it's done with a lot of panache and it's very well acted like you say although i find the fact that um daniel kalua is how you say it Mm -hmm. um is nominated for best lead actor is absolutely ludicrous because as much as i really like him as an actor and i i think this is a perfectly adequate performance it's not like a massively trying role is it i i don't know uh, no, i think um, he brings i think he brings a lot to it though i think you could have someone average or like a perfectly good actor in that role and it wouldn't have the same impact i think he I've brings a lot a, of yeah i mean into that's it. that's true but i've seen a million slasher films with similarly good performances from the lead who makes it to the end and you know i, I don't know it just it strikes me as no, 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 I completely agree. It's not like you'd give like Rose Byrne an Oscar nomination yeah. for Insidious, and she does. You know, she gives a, a good performance, a mm. perfectly serviceable. But yeah, mm. no, I, I agree, so. And 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 again, like the fact that Jordan Peele's been nominated for Best Director is is absurd because yeah, there's that nothing is absurd. about the, <laughs> there's nothing about the direction in the film that that yeah, makes it stand out. Special. Particularly, it's completely standard direction and he's, he does a perfectly fine job but it's not like mm-hmm. oh yeah everyone was making such a big deal out of how it was so shocking that this sketch comedian had come out with this accomplished scary film and what have you and i don't think it's that surprising at all i think watching the film it feels like a feature length comedy sketch the way it's like the whole setup the structure of it it's like a joke stretched out for 90 minutes and that's not in any way a slight against the film that's not a problem but this exact same film could have been truncated down to three minutes and could have been a sketch on a sketch show i agree that it doesn't quite seem to stick the landing with its thesis and like knowing what it's trying to say other than making fun of of casual racism in america and i i think Mm. you know at the end of the day that's fine yeah, I, I I suppose we're all on a similar page with regards to misinterpretation. I don't know. I, I feel like other people that I've spoken to have gotten more out of this film than I have. I didn't go back to it uh, for this recording, so I'm just talking about my memories of coming out of it from last mm. April. But I did come out of it quite pissed off with it and uh, <laughs> it was around the time with the the what Sol referred to earlier on when it was like the couple of months when it was all that anyone was talking about and mm. how brilliant it was and it wasn't really showing in like major cinemas it was just like the odd little one here and there so you had to kind of you know um scope it out and so I was I was strongly recommended it I went to see it and I I didn't know anything about it and then about halfway through it dawned on me that it was just Stepford Wives with black people instead and 
I just couldn't believe how it is just the Stepford Wives, which I'm a big fan of, the book and the two films. I think I'm the only fan of the Frank Oz directed one. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I think this is far better version of the yes. story than either of those films, but uh, to each their own. Yeah. It is no, very I much just... the same story, though, I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about, like, just the politics of it, but I think as a thriller, it disappointed me more than anything else. I, I went in expecting to sort of get my pulse going, have some exciting tense sequences, and a lot of it just, just seemed to be played for laughs, and hearing mm. what you said, Sol, about the director, because I've never looked him up, uh, that he comes from, like, a sketch background. That makes a lot of sense, because when I came out of the film the first time, I felt like all the reviews were saying, oh, it's this fabulous dark comedy and whatever. And dark comedy is a term that I think applies to a lot of films that were trying for serious drama <laughs> and actually came off unintentionally hilarious. So that's... Uh, no. Oh, no, it's dark I mean, comedy. Not, yeah, not to spoil things, but I've read a lot of things referring to Phantom Thread as a dark comedy as well, so it's a very <laughs> broadly applied term. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> okay, no. so, so I wasn't I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be laughing at it or with it. Um, I, until I, def- I, think I very the- much saw it... Uh, I think I was appreciating it as a comedy, and I think mm. it was all deliberate. Um, and- yeah. I thought the, the big reveal was ludicrous and it's amazing that a film was able to do such a stupid premise and work it just sort of just this didn't explain it at all which i think is <laughs> yeah. wise i think you just have to treat look this is your MacGuffin, right this is yeah, the re- yeah. this is the thing we just you just have to accept this and i and i, and I did and i think it's a testament to the, how good the film was in terms of i was just getting i was yeah. just into it that i just went okay fair enough yeah i won't i won't ask mm. question that too much but I, I do feel like this should really have been this little underground horror film, like like It Follows and things like that, just these little yeah. gems that people find and go, oh, have you seen this? And it's kind of weird that it's found as much mainstream success as it has. And and as as much as I'm being down on it in some ways, I, I must say, like, I, I'm really glad this is part of the Oscars conversation. It, I, I wouldn't pick it out as my, you know, one of my nine favourite films from the last year, but out of the selection that are nominated, it's one of my favourites, certainly. And we've, we've kind of been, like, tiptoeing around this whole, like, we don't know why it's here, why is that director there, why is that actor there? But, I, I mean, it is the elephant in the room that it is there because the it's Oscars the black needs to represent... <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think Jordan Peele, as the only black director nominated for Best Director, even with Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird, <laughs> I've not seen Lady Bird, but uh, they, they have a quota that they need to fulfil. Yeah. And this was a film directed by a black man and starring a black man that was very critically lauded. Yeah. Um, and the public liked as well, so... Yeah. And and the um, yeah and the other film that was a sort of dark horse that might have crept into the Oscars in a bizarre way but didn't uh, was Wonder Woman, because that was on the table. Oh. People calling for Patty Jenkins to get a Best Director nod and the film mm. to get Best Picture, which is absurd, because it's not even... It's fine. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was glad that this is the one that got in, because I think this is the film that deserved that sort of politically charged boost, if anything, did. Should we, should we do ratings for Get Out and then move uh, on? Yeah, I, I give it a seven. Mm. I give it a seven. I need, I really do need to rewatch it, but again, I, I have to go on my impression of it when I first saw it last year, and bearing in mind it was a very bad date that I went to <laughs> this film on, so that has perhaps factored into my rating. Is that because he didn't like your racist ranting after the film? <laughs> uh, was he a black guy that you were on a date with? Because that might have made things really awkward. No, he, well, for the fir- for, for first of all, he thought that this was an art film. What? Which I, well, yeah, I know, I was sort of like... Well, after yeah, he'd anyway. seen it, he thought that. Yes. Or he thought that... Right, yeah, well, that, he, yeah, right. It sounds like a. It it, it was idiot. the third and last date that I went on with that particular person, but um, I, I'm gonna go five. Okay, that is six point three, six point four. There's some <laughs> consistency. So from one film that's had a little boost from the minority. <laughs> uh, well, no, because women are a majority. Uh, what one politically charged bunch of nominations to another? <laughs> Lady Bird. Hmm. Now I haven't seen this one, so uh, or indeed the next two films are going to be discussing. So I'm going to have to just earwig in on your conversations. 
This was a very similar film experience to Call Me, Call by, me your by Your Name, name for me. That's exactly that, what I've written. Yeah, that that like perfectly solid, good little indie film. Enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fine. Um, I if I can just I'll just jump straight in because I agree with you entirely. And I actually watched this on the same day as Call Me by Your Name. I, I watched them back to back pretty much, and. It was exactly like this. This is every American indie coming of age film I've ever seen. It's like they're all exactly yeah. the same. It's like Juno. All set in, yeah, yeah, they're all set in the like in the in a sort of deserty landscape in a car, yeah. <laughs> like someone driving through it. And it was a good one, and it was well done. Mm. I enjoyed it. Uh, the acting was good, uh, mm. but it was just yeah. Like I feel like I've seen this film seven times. Yeah. And and it's very much the sort of film that I expect to see sneak in to the Oscars. So it's not like I'm not yeah. I wasn't watching it thinking like oh what's this doing here? But I do think the fact that uh, Greta Gerwig, I think the fact that she's nominated for director is the same exact thing as Jordan Peele. She mm. th- there's nothing about this film's direction that stands out. It's very pedestrian. It's just a a little indie film put together functionally. But, you know, it, it, it was good, and I thought it was a very nice portrait of what I assume is quite a universal experience amongst um, lots of women. <laughs> um, that that sort of frayed relationship with your mother seems to be quite a commonplace thing, I've observed. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, did, I can't say I watched this and thinking, oh, this is, must be what it's like as an adolescent woman. I, I, I identified with it as much as... Uh, if it had been a male character, I don't know if that particularly yeah. made a big difference. But I, the only the only bit of emotional, sort of genuine emotional impact I got out of it was from the mother. I thought Laurie Metcalf was excellent. Mm. Um, I, she's been Oscar nominated, and I'm happy with that because she's one yeah. of those actors who deserves recognition. And and literally, when you you see the mother in the, it, she's driving away in the car, and she has her emotional moment. That was the only real emotional moment for me. And given that she mm. is not the protagonist, and we see everything from the other character, from this girl's point of view. That's pretty much the only bit we see that is not from her point of view. Mm. That feels like that's wrong <laughs> in the film somehow. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I appreciate that. But I have to say, the mother character in this is so much like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it was, perhaps that's why it connected with me more. But it, it was unbelievable. I'm gonna have to like tell my all my family to watch this film because it's just like that. And like my and my sister had much more of a sparky relationship with my mother mm. in that kind of way than I ever did. Mm. And my brother as well. In fact, they, they always kind of clashed a lot more. Um, so I'm not sorry I necessarily related to that. But that 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 and and the dad as well really was who's like the passive one who just like all right let's just get on with yeah. it that's like my dad really but um, but but my but my mom is like very much the person who like she will find the negativity in any situation that was kind of uh, interesting for me to see but it didn't really <laughs> it didn't make the film any more personal to me I don't think it didn't really sell me on it mm. uh, but it was a perfectly good film what would you give it seven same here. Yeah. So oh. now it's tied with Dunkirk. Well, no, Dunkirk's winning because there were three votes, so that means it's more. So this, that does mean that so far we haven't found one that we all kind of liked. <laughs> if we, so far, <laughs> yeah. There's, the, I, there's I, always I, been at least one person going, "Nah, it was six. It wasn't that good." <laughs> the two strong ones in terms of being front runners for the awards are at the very end of the alphabetical list. So we'll mm. we'll see how we feel there, but. Uh, now, I'm very interested to hear what you two guys have to say about these next two. Uh, Phantom Thread is, I believe, the next on our list. Yes. Which uh, looked to me as the most boring thing <laughs> on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is like, he's a very good actor, but he's such a turn-off for me. Like, I would rather not <coughs> see a film that he was in, even if it was nominated for Everything Under the Sun. But from what I understand, this is his last film, so yippee for me. Yeah, but he, he'll come back in five years. He makes a film every five years. Mm-hmm. <sighs> But yeah, I, I must admit, there's credit to the marketing people because this film was exactly as boring as the trailer suggested it would be. <laughs> uh, and so you've got, mean, to, I, you've got to the, give credit there. It's Paul Thomas Anderson, lest we forget. So if you've ever seen a Paul Thomas Anderson film before, that that is exactly this film. It's incredibly meticulously well made. I cannot fault the production of it, but it's mm-hmm. also incredibly dull and... <laughs> just doesn't really connect with you on any level whatsoever. Yeah. Um, hmm. Like, what is the difference? In terms of the story, the general story of this, what is the difference between this and Fifty Shades of Grey? 
There's, this, this is just well, this is it just got better lighting and better yeah actors. it's far better um put together and that but goes... in terms of just like a shit abusive relationship dynamic that oh, no, yeah, yeah, should it's be absolutely... in, it's just like this is the same although to be fair the this is a bit more of a back and forth it's kind of like 50 shades of gray if anastasia Steele tied up christian every now and then and gave him a spanking well, that's it, exactly. Halfway through this film, pretty much halfway through the, the running time, it suddenly takes a mad veer off where she decides to poison him. It becomes a very different film, really, doesn't it? it yeah. Well, it completely changes her character, but then the film doesn't really change because it just plods on the same same old stuff. But it completely changes the nature of the film. It comes mm. out of nowhere. And it's like, if, if you'd taken the first 47 minutes of this film and just cut them off... <laughs> this film would be exactly the same. It would be better because it wouldn't be as long. Yeah, I yeah, that's pretty true. And it's weird because I do, I really like the kind of dysfunctional relationship that they portray on paper as a, a thing to explore in film. And I thought the ending was um, it had the potential to be very moving and sweet, but. Again, it's just put together in such a cold way mm. that it just never quite does anything. Yeah, it just felt so overly melodramatic mm. and unrealistic. And, and it, uh, it, it, I mean, it really reminded me of There Will Be Blood. That's probably the go-to. But it didn't have that element of insanity that permeates just, like, under the surface in There Will Be Blood. There was no scene where... Daniel Day Lewis started screaming about drinking people's milkshakes and throwing bowling balls across the room, um, and I thought his performance in this was very, like he was. It was very good acting, but yeah. you were just kind of thinking, like, why? Why was this character the one that interested you? Well, I, th- I, th- I assume it's because this character's extremely obsessive to the point where it, it kind of shuts out other people in his life. And I assume Daniel Day Lewis is like that because he's like the biggest knob in Hollywood, <laughs> uh, and, and he must be a nightmare to work with. <laughs> it's just, it's just, um, there was another element of this film that basically that that character Daniel Day Lewis's character it did really remind me of myself at my worst. Like <laughs> I, there was so many aspects of him that I was like, I've well, done did that. you did you go to <laughs> cafes and order like? 50 <laughs> breakfasts in one go and then then ask the waitress out for dinner in a very cold, emotionless way. And, no? uh, kind of. I, I did once date a girl who worked at Greg's. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, like, but I mean, in terms of the relationship and like, I've, b- I've been there where like, I fall in love. Like, oh my God, I'm totally in love with you. I want to be with you forever. And then three months later, I'm like, why are you so fucking irritating? Why are you buttering your toast so fucking loud? Get out of my life. <laughs> that's what it was um, like living with you. You got so angry with me for like how I grate my cheese. <laughs> Maybe he fell in love with you first. <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember you like scolding me for grating my cheese incorrectly. It's amazing how many people I meet who just don't know how to fucking grate cheese. Like, what's wrong with you? How do you grate cheese correctly or incorrectly? Exactly. Like? Surely this is the only <laughs> correct way. <laughs> Can smear it all over the thing, uh, like an idiot. I mean, let, let, let's. Can I just point out that I don't eat like every meal for Alan is grated <laughs> cheese on pasta with barbecue sauce, <laughs> whereas I maybe have cheese on, you know, maybe one in three, one in four meals. It's not, <laughs> He's saying yeah. I'm well practiced with my grating. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, so, but yeah, this is like me, maybe six, seven years ago, um, when I was, my, I was selfish and, 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 but my, my takeaway from that was that I realized that being in a relationship is not good for me and I'm, it's not suited to me. Whereas this guy thought he should marry her. And I think that was a mistake. <laughs> and I think, I think the well, film think- bears that out. I think there's something to be said for the fact mm. that she seems to be similarly toxic as a human being. and she Eventually, she doesn't at first, and then she pushes mm. back in this really odd way, mm. um, extreme way, and it didn't feel very realistic at all to me. It didn't feel mm. very true. I, I, I see where you're coming from, yeah. I mean, did you, for example, if you were writing your you know, play or something, Alan, and mm-hmm. your girlfriend came in with a cup of tea, would you scold her for the interruption? <laughs> What literally take the tea and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I'm not literally that, but I've, I, I knew exactly what he was going through. And it's only when I've lived with someone, it's like when you're trying, you just can't get away from them. I think what you need, Alan, is a shed at the bottom of the garden and <laughs> go and sit in. Oh, God. Well, just a pathetic cliche. <laughs> I you could become. do better than that and get an allotment. <laughs> yeah, oh, you are such an allotment kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he'd, he'd get really angry because all the hipsters would like, move in because it's trendy now. And Alan would be telling they, them they're not. Yeah, they wouldn't know how to grow tomato plants lentils properly. properly, and he'd get angry about their <laughs> plants wil- wilting next to his prize marrow. <laughs> They're all growing fucking kale. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this this film spoke to me on that level, but I still hated it. I give yeah. it. I, I give it a four. Ooh. Ooh, I give it a seven because, like I say, I think objectively it's a very well made film, but it, it really does leave you cold. You've got to be a fan of what these guys do, and so what's that? Five, uh, uh, six? No, five point five out of ten. Mm-hmm. Our lowest rated one. Ooh, mm, interesting. I'll- Give that one a miss, then. <laughs> yeah, you, you will not um, like a yeah, Calvin if, if, based on what you said at the start. It's yeah, mm. but I'm annoyed you haven't seen the post Calvin. Well, you know, I forgot that this was even nominated because I saw a film called I Tonya, thinking <laughs> that that was part of the Best Picture nominations, and I was going to make a real effort to see them all this year after my poor performance last year, and then after coming out of I Tonya and looking at the list and realising it wasn't there <laughs> in the Best Picture category, I just. So fuck it, I'm not going to bother. But you liked I, Tonya, didn't you? I thought you really enjoyed it. Yes, no, I, I liked it very much, yes. Oh. yes. See, I, I don't know, I, I can't imagine Alan's going to be massively into this one too, and I just feel like you would have been the person to come in like, oh no, I loved this film. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm probably going to start slagging it off in a minute, but I don't know, Alan. Well, it is how did... <laughs> Spielberg, Tom Hanks, Mel- yeah, Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, exactly. Yeah, but Alan, you, and, and yeah, well, here I go. You list all those things and it's just like, <laughs> yeah, tick them off, tick them off, tick them off. Solid bit of acting, good direction. Mm. 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 I'll take issue with that. Well, no, I, I, I must admit, I thought this, this didn't feel like a Spielberg film. I'll give it that. But it felt well directed. I disagree. I, I think this felt lazy by the numbers film. Like, it just, just turning up to a job each day and everyone was putting in their nine to five and it was all mm. functional because they're all talented yeah, people. Yeah, but... I mean, that's it. It felt very functional. Yeah, and I was really, like, unengaged for the first 20 minutes or so and yeah, I found yeah. it very disjointed and slow and it kind of picked up as the plot kicked in and I think this film has um, received a slight political boost like uh, Get Out and Lady Bird just because it's quite timely with the relationship between the White House and news media at the moment. Well, I don't know about that because I, I thought pretty much this film could only be made as a period piece because there's no way you can make a film now about how the press are this kind of resolute industry that will stand up against corruption and that politicians uh, lying about what happened during a war would even make the news. Yeah. This is, I felt completely unconnected to this story because it felt so far removed from the reality I live in. No, I mean, you, you could make more or less the exact same film, but you just have to up all the ante. I mean, that that's... It'd be the same beats and everything. It would just be much more severe stories that they're dealing with and so on. But obviously it's based on a true story. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, like I say, I didn't, it didn't feel like a Spielberg film particularly, mm. but it felt like a great director trying something a bit new uh, rather than mm. him just not knowing what he was doing. And I like that. I like that a 70-year-old guy is going, oh, it's just, I'm going to try something a bit different. Like he's got nothing to prove anymore. I, he's I, just, just, I think what it he felt wants. like a great director who just is putting all his time and effort into Ready Player One. I think the beginning was clumsily directed. I, I think the performances were those actors left on autopilot without a director guiding them. Um, which isn't to say they were bad performances, but I don't know. They, they, it just felt very lazy to me. I know what you mean. I, 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 I'm not saying I quite agree with you, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, yeah. What 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 do you give it, Alan? Seven. Yeah, well, I give it a seven, but it's a very low seven. This one. Yeah. Mm. Moving on, getting interesting now. Calvin, you haven't spoken for a bit, so do you want to? Shall I lead with uh, the Shape of Water? Okay then. Well, uh, I I just saw this film last night, mm. so it's very fresh in my mind, and I absolutely loved it. It's 
my favourite of the films that I've seen nominated for Best Picture. I'd love it if it won, just mm. because I know we talked about Get Out being a genre film, horror, mm. but this film, I mean, it's it's a drama, obviously, but it has uh, sci-fi elements in there, and it's a fantasy film at its heart, about a woman that mm. falls in love with a fish man. Um, I, I just, I was thoroughly engrossed and wrapped up in it. I thought the characters were all so interesting in their own ways. Cause you've got mm. Sally Hawkins, and then the people around her, Richard Jenkins, uh, Octavia Spencer, Michael Stuhlberger. Um, oh no, Stuhlberg. <laughs> Stuhlberg. They were all so just all the supporting characters felt really nicely developed, Doug and Jones. they had just enough screen time to be well. Yeah, Doug Jones, of course, and Michael Shannon is the oh, is the villain. Shannon, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I I just yeah I I really really liked it. I shed a tear. Spoilers, I guess, but at the end when she develops gills and that's the happy ending, so that she can live underwater with the fish man. I was kind of like, oh, that's so silly, but it's at the very end of the film. I guess I can go with it. Well, ba- can I can I go yeah, in between you, go you first, just so, because yeah. basically I don't have anything to add. Um, okay. I'm on board with Calvin. <laughs> I This is Guillermo del Toro firing at his um, best, really. It's, it's not as good as Pan's Labyrinth, but it's top tier Guillermo del Toro. It's everything he does. It, it, you can tell it's one of his films that he truly cares about rather than one of his mm. sort of more marketable things that he does on the side. Um, Pacific Rim. <laughs> yeah, the the cast were brilliant. The whole film was so just entertaining. Yeah, I, I just thought everything about it. The production design was gorgeous. The music oh, was really beautiful. good. Um, I mm. thought the ending was incredibly emotional again. And the fact that they managed to make something as fucking ludicrous and mm-hmm. absurd as this woman falling in love and fucking a fish. Um, yes. Palatable. Like, yeah, not only palatable, but to make it work with emotional resonance is remarkable. Mm. So I, yeah. I really enjoyed it, and it is by far and away my favourite of this year's Best Picture nominations. Ooh. Oh, j- j- just to add to that before Ellen uh, jumps in, I think it's it's the first film in... God, I can't think of another film that was nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars where I'm, like, really rooting for it. Like, mm. I, I would <laughs> genuinely be really happy if I yeah. woke up and read the news that this had won, mm. and I can't say I feel that way about these awards normally. Mm. Same. Well, I, I did like the film, uh, and I say that as a preface because it seems like most of my notes are quite negative, <laughs> but I think that says a lot about how I enjoyed the overall experience, that I was mm. picking out the points that kind of like, oh, well, this, you know, and I think I could pretty much sum it up in one sentence, which is style over substance. It didn't feel like enough substance there for me. Mm. It was very stylish, and it's done really nicely. That central story, it's very sweet. It's really engaging. That main character, fantastically played. The the supporting characters, really well played, but they are just there to prop up that character. They don't Mm. really have any purpose themselves, and they try and put some on which doesn't really add anything. And Richard Jenkins and Octavia Spencer are the two kind of main supporting characters like her friends, mm. great performances. And it's, it's, th- those are characters that could have been weak and lost yeah. with a not great actor. But I think it needed great actors because I don't think the characters were much there. Uh, they try and give each of them a little bit of story and it just doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't create anything. Uh, the Michael Shannon character, I liked him. He was kind of, I, th- I found him very funny and a, that was dark comedy. Um, mm. and, and that whole bit felt very satirical of this, Americana, 1960s Americana. And again, that didn't quite go anywhere for me when you go and see him at home with his family and it, you just see this little sketch of, yeah, Americana and I felt like that. <laughs> Either do more of it or don't yeah, do it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of false leads that kind of felt like they were going somewhere and then didn't. And, and other little things like the way that she would, she would go to the tank and tap on the tank at, at first. And I thought it was going to come onto this whole thing about sound and percussion and how we communicate. Mm. And, and that didn't go anywhere. Um, I thought like the dancing was going to become something. There was a lot of these things that never quite went anywhere. 
Mm. And it, I think I was a bit frustrated by it, if anything else. I found the plot mm. really quite predictable. As soon as we, she can't talk yeah. and she's got, these, she's got these scars on her neck, and I thought, well, they're gills. They look like gills. Yeah. And this is all about water. Like That's obviously going to be something later on. Uh, it, in fact, it was so obvious that I thought it might be a double bluff. I thought it might be kind of like <laughs> they're trying to trick us into something. The set design and the look of it, yeah, it's really good. I'm not quite sure if just making everything green is enough. Um, I think the green everything is perfectly fine for a film that's so heavily about like murky water and shit. I'll I'll defend it. Yeah, I don't know. It feels yeah. a bit like it, it feels a bit style of a substance, basically, is that, and only a bit. It, it felt like an auteur film, but it, that auteur is Jean Pierre Genet, and I don't know why Guillermo del Toro is just doing Genet. But I like the you know del Toro's films are all about wanting to have sex with the monsters, so he's finally just done it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes makes sense, you know. Mm. Uh, so I think I was a bit frustrated by it, if, if nothing else. Like, it, it, it felt like this could have been a really amazing film, and it just didn't yeah. quite take me there. Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with that. I I really liked it, but it did feel somewhat simplistic in, in a way where it could have been, as you say... A few tweaks could have made it a, an absolutely outstanding film, and like I say, that that's kind of what Pan's Labyrinth had going for it, in my opinion. And this just didn't quite get to the same level. I agree that there were a few things that were just sort of left lingering there that you think is going to become something later on. There was that whole thing about Michael Shannon having sex with his wife, mm. and he like covers her mouth up, and he's going, "No, no, I like the silence." And yeah. then he sort of comes onto Sally mm. Hawkins' character later on. Yeah. Can't speak, so it's, you know that kind of yeah. And and like the whole thing with his the whole thing with his fingers that never really that just seemed to be a comedy element. Yeah, it was still that weird. He had like these dead gag, fingers. But I was fine with that. Yeah. Like it, it's even like there's a, there's a point where Sally Hawkins is just waiting for a bus, and there's just like a comically large man there, like holding a cake with a slice cut out of it. And does he have a balloon as well? I can't remember. But there are just these little flourishes that just make shots and scenes interesting, and I I, I like it. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, ratings then. Uh, yeah, I give it an eight. I give it an eight. I give it a nine. Mm. Mm. That is, yeah, that's 8.3333333333, which I'm calling 8.4. In- incorrectly calling 8.4. So that's the clear favourite, So then. far. Although we've all basically said that <laughs> we like this one more <laughs> than the next one. <laughs> yeah. Which, does that say a lot about us? I don't know, because this one is the favourite, I guess. Yes, it's, it's the one that's been winning all of the Best Picture Awards at the other mm. show. The BAFTAs... Uh, not to give too much away for when we record these things, but the BAFTAs happened recently, and last night this they've given it away exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri won best film. So, oh god, he's, he's Michael McDonough, right? No, Martin McDonough. No, which Martin, one's which? Because his brother's McDonough. also Martin a successful writer director who's made some good stuff. Less successful. <laughs> so he is a phenomenally talented writer who also directs films um i really like uh what he does in bruges is i think by far and away his best film to date oh, I, I i didn't look up the director so this is all new oh, i didn't realize he did in bruges i love in bruges uh he made seven psychopaths after in bruges which was his sort of very triumphant debut but he was a, a playwright for the longest time which is presumably why it was such an accomplished script. You know, he'd been honing the craft for years. Uh, Seven Psychopaths was very much a kind of lesser film, and it was it was fine, but it was sort of this awkward, mm. Americanized version of what he does. Three Billboards is sort of splitting the difference between the two, if you ask me. It's a it's a really good bit of writing. It's a really strong film, very well made, great performances but also a bit meandering and unfocused in ways. Yeah, at times you're not entirely sure what it's trying to do. I, I, I really liked it. I don't want to be too down on it. Again, we're very much on the same page, I I, I think. I, I liked it very much. Second favourite of the bunch. I don't know if I've got much more to add to what you said. Mm. Uh, great performances all around. I think there was, there was something that occurred to me about halfway through the film, because I saw this with my stepmom. And I never went into this film thinking that I was going to get a kind of mystery thriller. Mm. I, you know, the, the, the who did or didn't 
yeah. rape and murder Francis McDormand's daughter was of no concern to me. Yeah. But then about halfway through the film, my stepmom sort of nudged me and like pointed at Sam Rockwell and said, oh, I, I bet he did it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh yeah, actually, that this is sort of a mystery, isn't it? Like, who who did it? And then later on, they play with the idea that they're going to hmm. solve that. Uh, yeah, I never And then really... they kind of end without really resolving anything. And like, yeah, that was a MacGuffin, really, wasn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't the point. No. Um, it was just and, the, and what I'll say is, I mean, I... <sighs> The one thing I've, I I want to say, actually, that I forgot to mention in my bit is that um, I kind of wish this film had ended about 15 minutes earlier. Mm-hmm. You, you know, the, the, the scene yeah. where Sam Rockwell walks over to the the guys, like, sat next to him in the bar. The suspected... Yeah, and, and you just hear him... Yeah. Um, it's the guy who was in earlier being really creepy, and that that's there's, like, a shot of them sitting next to each other, and that's it. And I just thought, like, yeah, that's the end of your film. Because they've set this mm. up, they've explained, like, Woody Harrelson was saying, like, nine times out of ten, this stuff's just solved with yeah, exactly. some idiot in a bar. That's the end of your film, and mm. plays out in your head. You go, right, he's going to be the guy who brings him in, he did it, he's going to have mm. his moment of redemption, it all plays out, and you, mm. you don't need to see the rest of it. And it just kind of, it just mm. felt unnecessary, and it would have been a much neater, nicer film, I think, if it had ended mm. there. But... I think the point is that it isn't neat and nice. And Yeah, no, I agree. For the last 15 minutes, I kept thinking, this could be the last scene. This could be the last <laughs> shot. It is just going to end. It's not going to sort of conclusively wrap up who did it. Hmm. Alan, you've not you've not said your piece yet, I don't think. Um, I hated it. Really? <gasps> yes. Oh. Well, hate perhaps a bit strong, but I really didn't like it. Of all the films, or these, of the, watching the trailers, this was the one I was kind of looking forward to. It had the people involved that I like. Mm. In Bruges, one of the best scripts from a script writing point of view yeah. ever written. <laughs> and I do like Martin McDonough, and I just think this was just a major misstep. I think all his films and his plays are about guilt and mm. recrimination. They're all just full of violence and anger. And it, I feel like I've seen it before. I found the characters to be really unrealistic. I found the behavior to be very unrealistic. Uh, for most of it, I was trying to figure out which part of the 80s it was set in. Um, and then it turned out it was not. It's set now. And I was like, uh, how, uh, how is this behavior that happens now? Like what? It, it, it felt like another time. And I think, I think that's the idea that it's this small town mentality, like in the backwoods of nowhere in Missouri. But I, I, I was just found it impossible to relate to any of the characters. I don't know what Frances McDormand's character was doing. She's, she's this very strong, very uh, powerful, confident woman. Mm. And then you find out she's being abused by her husband. It doesn't tally. And we don't have this moment of where she's changed because she's grown from an experience mm. or something. Yeah. At one point he comes back and like, assaults yeah. him again and she kind of just lets him do it and him coming back yeah him coming back and there's friction between them i, I was all right with that but the fact that he'd previously been abusive and she'd been abused if he'd been abusive and she'd kicked him out mm. that, i, I agree sense. actually the the character that was presented on screen is someone that like yeah maybe she's grown and changed and he used to be abusive but the character as presented you got the sense with someone who would have like you know stabbed him in the leg with a kitchen knife like when he came at her or something mm. Sam Rockwell, in broad daylight, throws someone out of a window. And, like, the police who are there, not for the other new chief turning up, they weren't even going to, like, go, oh, that's probably not on. You think you might have to do some paperwork or something. <laughs> like, they weren't even going, oh, right, we're going to have to make up some story now to get you out of this. Mm. They were just like, oh. And all the people just stood around going, oh, he's just chucked someone out the window. <laughs> you know, old Sam Rockwell, you know what he's like. It was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Don't, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, there's mm. and it was definitely just, it truth felt to what so you're unrealistic saying, right? that I just had no, I couldn't get into it at all. And and I, I, this is another Martin Madonna thing to do. Having your characters say "cunt" every other sentence does not make them gritty and raw. It, it's just, it's just swearing, <laughs> right? It's like, and, and and when it's not in an Irish accent, it's not charming. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't know if Woody Harrelson does it; it's charming. I can't remember. I thought Woody Harrelson was really good in this film. I did like him. Um, The suicide thing came a bit out of nowhere, but I was okay with that because it meant it had an impact. But I feel like we should have had a bit more of a setup for that. It's it's that whole thing of a a deus ex machina, like, is bad writing if it saves your character and helps them out. 
if it gets mm. them into more trouble, then it's fine. And I think because that that <laughs> largely came out of nowhere, but it like really, you know, threw a spanner in the works for the protagonist. I think it was fine. And uh, the blending of dark humor in the tragic story, which is very much Martin McDonough's thing, didn't work for me here either. Sam Rockwell was just sort of playing a clown throughout most of the film, and it felt really out of place. His character felt out of place most of the time. And from a direction point of view, I thought it was very pedestrian. I thought it was very boring directing. But I, I think the guy's a writer rather than a director, so I'm kind of yeah, I'm willing I mean, to let that go. But I, I agree he's very much a writer first and a director second. But I think it was a confidently directed piece. It was, you know, perhaps not jaw-dropping direction, but there there were elements of directorial flourish in there, and the, the strength of the performances says a lot about... Um... I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not that... I wasn't that fussed about Frances McDormand. Like, she, she's mm. solid, but, you know, it didn't... Woody Harrelson I was happy with. Sam Rockwell, again, he's doing his thing. The character didn't work for me, so I couldn't yeah. really appreciate it. I liked the kid who gets thrown out the window. I liked him. Yeah, he was... The son I liked. Yeah, yeah. And I, I liked the bit where um, it, she finds out the husband is the one who set the billboards on fire. Yeah. It, it made her reposition her idea on hate and like what, and that was what I liked because I thought we'd come into an ending where it's like, okay, we don't have to be defined by hatred. Uh, mm. And someone who is like suffered great loss, she's trying to externalize that by f- finding someone to blame. And you, and that's not really how you deal with emotions. You need to sort of deal with yourself. But then at the ending, it's like, oh, should we go and kill this guy? Cause he's probably done something bad. And they're like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, and it's just like, what are you trying to say with this? Like, I don't know. Because I thought yeah, no, we were I going to a mean. point here and then we never reached it. And There were there were points where, yeah, the end, like I said, it should have ended sooner. I think it should have ended on that. But honestly, like you, you could have just had it that like Sam Rockwell died in that fire and she kind of realized she'd gone too far. And But, you know, I, I think in spite of all this, it's a really thoroughly entertaining film. And My mum liked it. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, anyway, so uh, ratings? Well, for me, it's an eight. Same here. I think, in spite of its flaws, I mean, those flaws are what keep it from being a nine or a ten, basically. But I yeah. think it's still a very accomplished bit of work. Uh, I gave it four. Ooh. But f- I'm I'm going to put it above Phantom Thread. <laughs> so it's not the worst film. It's the I second can't believe you. Uh, okay. Phantom Thread should not be the lowest one out of the lot for you. That's mental. Uh, so it has six, <laughs> six recurring, 6.7 out of 10, it's which is solid. really low okay. overall. Um, yeah. I think that's quite unfair, really. Isn't so it? The Shape of Water was our collective favourite. Could you let us know the other podium places or the order overall? All right. Well, at, at the bottom is Phantom Thread, because Alan tanked the uh, mm-hmm. the rating. And that's fair. Mm-hmm. That's our, our Diminishing Returns worst of the year. I think that's very unfair, actually. I think, personally, I think Phantom <laughs> Thread's far more worthy of being here than The Post or Darkest Hour. But uh... And then uh, join seventh place, Darkest Hour, and Get Out. I feel bad that Get Out's so low mm. down now. But... Mm. Is that that's that was your fault, fault though, so you... <laughs> Tough tits. Mm. Mm. Okay, and then joint... Six, no, joint fifth, three billboards, and call me by your name, tied ah. with mm. six point seven out of ten, mm-hmm. and then the post with seven out of ten, but only two of us voted on it. See, I think that that's, I mean, that's stock seven, isn't it? It's siete. Yeah. It's just, yeah, nothing is special about it at all. Oh, sorry, no, the post is tied with Lady Bird, which also has seven, but we both have. see. I'd definitely sooner watch Lady Bird again than the post. So Dunkirk <laughs> is our second favorite of the the lot. Overall, who'd have thought? Um, and then Shape of Water, the clear winner, eight point four out of ten. Mm. 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 Yeah, that was one. Like, I guess how you felt about Three Billboards, though. I I kind of liked it despite all these things that I could th- find that I I kind of pulled out about mm. it. What would your sort of num- number one choice? Not not in terms of what you think will win, but what was your what was your favorite? I think my top three would be Get Out, Three Billboards, and The Shape of Water. And then everything else is just kind of a blur of Oscar-y stuff that I don't really care about. <laughs> uh, Shape of Water, Three Billboards, Dunkirk, in that order. Descending. Okay. <laughs> um, you're not going to like this, but I think Darkest Hour is probably my favourite of the lot. You're a maniac. <laughs> Why? What on... <laughs> this is, what, is, what is up with you, Alan? I don't even... <laughs> 
This is Suicide Squad. Think that our discussion of it was that positive. No, it wasn't. Like, this is Suicide Squad all over again. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Darkest Hour for me was by far and away the worst one. Like not even like the, oh god. I mean, I guess yeah. My least favorite, your favorite. That's why this is a great show because we have a whole <laughs> spectrum of opinion. Uh, what about the other awards, eh? Well, I don't really know much about uh, the other nominees because I only know these because we watch them all. I don't really like to get that involved because the Oscars is a load of bollocks. But if you'd like to tell me what they are, I'll, I'll give you my opinion. <laughs> um, best lead actor, we've got Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread. Bollocks. Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out. Fair. Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. Don't Nobody's seen it. Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour and fair. Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name. Easily the best. My guess looking at them is that Denzel Washington probably deserves it, but no one's seen it. Seen it. <laughs> yeah, no, no idea. Um, the, the, the little boy in... Uh, he's not that little. The, the, the kid in uh, Call Me By Your Name, easily the best performance. Yeah. Isn't he like 23? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least he's a bit more twinkish in that film, though, isn't he? Uh, but yeah, definitely in, t- in terms of an acting performance, absolutely... Stunning. He's in Lady Bird as well. Um, out of the three that I've seen, that yes, he would be my preferred choice to mm. win Best Actor. I would like it if Daniel Kaluuya won, just because I think that'd be a, a great upset. <laughs> but it's going to be Gary Oldman. Yeah, it seems a bit inevitable that it's Gary Oldman, doesn't it? Yeah. Which is a bit of a sh- which I'm, I, I'm all right with that. I, I'm not going to look back on the history of Oscar wins and pick that one out as a as a terrible injustice. <laughs> I think it annoys me because it's like so obvious that that role is just like <laughs> yeah, you could have given yeah. it to almost any actor of the similar age, and if they did, you know, a decent enough impression, great, mm. you've got your nomination. What about actress anyway? Yeah, go on. What else? We, we can't got? leave the ladies out. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, Francis McDormand who's gonna. Be. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is the most we sort of nineteen seventies thing you've ever can't, said. What the beautiful ladies. <laughs> Uh, it's nothing mm. without the ladies. Let's have a hand for the ladies. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely black dresses they're all wearing. Who's in then? Who's Francis McDormand for Three Billboards? Yes, Margot man. Robbie for I Tonya. Meryl Streep for The Post. Sally Hawkins for The Shape of Water. And oh, how do you say it? Char Charis 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 Suazi Suazi. I've heard it said so many times recently. Saracy Renan. Uh, Cersei. It's not Cersei. <laughs> Cersei. I, oh, Do I it with an Irish accent. I listened to Greta Gerwig the other day. If I listened to two interviews with Greta Gerwig recently. I think it's Shersha. Shersha, that was it. Shersha Ronan for Lady Bird. Calvin, you've seen I, Tonya, so how was that one? Oh, yeah, I loved I, Tonya. Good, solid 8 out of 10 from me. I I think I preferred it to Three Billboards, so it, mm. if I was to lump it in with the other best picture films I've seen, it'd be number two. Very funny, a fascinating story. I've only seen three of these performances. I think Sally Hawkins is by far and away my favourite, but I would sooner give it to Margot Robbie than mm. Frances McDormand. I think Sally Hawkins is brilliant and I love her, but I wasn't blown away by her performance in The Shape of Water. I, I think that's going to be a, a foot in the door to make some other films where she really gets to prove herself and, and deserve an Oscar. But I, Personally, I'd give it to Meryl Streep out of the four I've seen, but it really is Meryl <sighs> Streep on. on autopilot. Yeah, it's just like... The only reason they put Meryl Streep in films is so they can fill up these actress categories. Yeah. Out of those choices, and one of them I haven't seen, I haven't seen I, Tonya, I would go Sally mm. Hawkins. I'm also not like championing that as a, as a mm. result either. Do you think that, look, we need to cast a kind of a, a, a matriarch who's quite spunky and, and fractious. Do you want Laurie Metcalf or Alison Janney? <laughs> oh, Alison, well, I haven't seen Lady Bird, I suppose, but Alison Janney, I think, has it in the bag, consi- yeah. g- looking at all the other awards she's won. She has won, she's won it, she's brilliant. Win I, I did think Laurie Metcalf was brilliant. I haven't seen Alison Janney, but she is generally brilliant, so I'm, I'm not surprised. I think it's between the two of them. So who else is in that? Uh, well, Octavia Spencer's in there, which I think silly because she's barely in the shape of water. She she is a phenomenal talent as well. Yeah. I love her, mm. but she doesn't. That's not one of her. The help is the sort of film she mm. needs to win for. Did she win? For I think that? she I did. She did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mary J. Blige for Mudbound, which I haven't seen. Mm, she's a well, she's a singer and. And I guess we'll have to do supporting actor now, so the men aren't left out. No. Those beautiful no. No. Screw men, they get everything. Yeah. Those beautiful men, aren't they looking good tonight? <laughs> no. They're all wearing black. Mm. 
<laughs> I, I, I've just noticed that Michael Shannon's not nominated. I thought he was. No, no. Richard Jenkins is. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Shape Water, Woody Harrelson, Sam Rockwell, Christopher Plummer from yeah, All the Yeah, I'm glad the Christopher World. Plummer got in there. I'd love him to win. Yeah. I've not yeah. seen it, but I just like no, I the idea of him winning from mm. replacing someone like, a month before the film was about to be released. But he was Ridley Scott's original choice. and um, Yes. It's, yeah, and he's, I like him. I know he's the oldest acting nominee ever. Yeah, he's like 80. Is he really? Like is that a joke or is he No, really? no, he is. No, that's true. It's a wow. fact. True fact. Um, but yeah, can we let's touch on directing because that's actually a very interesting category this year. I mean, this is an interesting year for Oscars because there's no there's no film that like completely has it in the bag. There normally is. Well, if Three Billboards win like wins Best Picture, it can't win for directing because he's not even nominated. It, it's a which is bizarre. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense because the other films are. It's not well directed. More well directed, I'd say. Christopher Nolan like deserves to be nominated for directing Dunkirk, even though I didn't think it was that amazing, because it's directed yeah. meticulously well. Guillermo del Toro is probably going to win it, I think, and I'd deserves like to be too. Looking at the yeah. list, I can't see any of the others winning it. And I think Paul Thomas Anderson deserves to be there for Phantom Thread, even though it's not the best film ever, honestly. I, I like that the three of those guys got in. <sighs> I mean, Jordan Peele and Greta Gerwig, neither of those directorial efforts are particularly remarkable yeah. they're, mm. they're solid and yeah they... from a directing point of view yeah nothing particularly interesting there you know who i would have given some awards awards love to who i would have given mother some attention mother <laughs> yeah it was a very divisive film but i think jennifer lawrence deserved some credit for her performance in it even if you didn't like the film itself she was very good in it and I know I've gone on about it before, but I think the Big Sick should be sweeping these Oscars. Should have been nominated for Best Picture. Should have been a, a contender to actually win it. Kumail Nanjiani should have been nominated for Best Lead Actor. Um, Holly Hunter should have been nominated for Best Supporting Actress. And that's minority people. That's a, a like a Pakistani guy. That's the wrong minority. We're not bothered about them. <laughs> no. Amer- no, Americans aren't. Yeah. Bo- well, actually, no, no. I mean, I, I think this is genuinely a, a, a thing. My old, uh, my old flatmate is Indian, and he would often talk about how you know there's all these uh, Oscars so white, Oscars so white, and all that kind of stuff, and it's all about you know African Americans when actually they don't really represent a good you know. When when was the last time you saw a lead Chinese guy in a? You've Hollywood just brought action? something to my mind there. I watched Downsizing recently. Which oh. was one of the most interesting films I've seen recently in terms of where oh, it goes. God, you would have liked it. It's a real roller coaster ride. And, but the, the woman in that who is, uh, <laughs> of, she, her parents are Vietnamese and she plays a Vietnamese character. She's American, mm. but she's a really good performance in that. And, um, mm. has, yeah, has not really been given a sniffing on the, uh, uh Oscars. Well, mm. yeah, cause it, cause it wasn't a good film. <laughs> I really liked it, actually. Oh, for fuck's sake, Alan. Calvin, if you watch Downsizing at any point, like, you'll be on my side with this. It's a weird film. It's a weird film, though. <laughs> it, 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 makes, it, it biggest... makes for a good discussion, actually. We might do it one day. It's the biggest waste of a good concept. It's just meandering. It just goes off on tangents. Well, that's it. It doesn't know it takes... what it is. It doesn't know what it's trying to do at all. It goes, it goes through about six different genres <laughs> over the film. Yeah. It's a weird film, but I quite liked it. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right, yeah. Uh, good performance from um, whoever that actor is who played the, uh, Hong the, Chow. She's called woman. Yeah, uh, she was good. Hang on, I've got a little addendum we can stick on the end here. Uh, Calvin, yes. When we did our Oscars episode last year, still available on DimReturns.com, mm. we, me and Sol, had seen all the films and we discussed them. You hadn't mm. seen them all, so have you seen any of them since? Yeah, Moonlight is the only one that I've gone to and seen and i did i think i mentioned it on our okay. episode that i was meaning well, to watch it let's um, see so uh, moonlight i'm just looking uh so last year mm. uh it walked away with 65 percent 6.5 out of 10 but it was my because... it was my top choice of the lot i gave it an that's eight that's it it oh, got wow. it got an eight out of 10 from alan and a five out of 10 from me i it was my least favorite again actually it was my <laughs> least favorite of the nominees that year alan's favorite <laughs> Um, and I won last Alan's year, so let's see how we do. To push it into our top ten films of the year for 2017, <laughs> which is outrageous. 
<laughs> oh well, I, it'll be be probably brought right back down then because I re- I really didn't like it. I just thought it was very dull, meandering, and not in a good way. Like yeah. call me by your name. It didn't yeah. paint much of a a mood or atmosphere. It just I I just I I don't I really don't understand why people were raving about it so much. And indeed, like I went into work the next day after watching it, and when I just sort of announced to the room that oh, I watched it and didn't like it, indeed, a couple of people were like, "Oh, why? What on earth?" Blah blah blah. And, you know, n- not necessarily filmy type people either. Yeah, I I've had similar conversations with people, and they're very like, "Oh, but you can't you can't deny it's like." a good film. And I'm like, no, I can. I think it's, <laughs> I genuinely don't think it's very well thought through, written, crafted. I So, Calvin Dyson, more racist than gay. <laughs> Official <laughs> result. Two years running. <laughs> racist <laughs> film reviews on diminishing returns. No, no, no. It's nothing to, it's nothing to do with the films being, you know, <laughs> Predominant. Oh, never mind. I'm not even going to just rate the my... film. Come on. Look, I hate Moonlight as well. All right, I thought it was shit, so it's fine. Four. Ooh. I'll never watch it again. That means our new score is fifty-seven percent, five point six recurring, five point seven. Whoa. Which means it's not as lowly rated as Lion oh, okay, or that's, Hacksaw that's Ridge. That's definitely fair. But it is our third least rated <laughs> film of the last Oscars now. So I'm pleased mm. with that. I'm, I'm pleased we marked that down a bit. <laughs> What's our best of last year? Was it La La Land? It was La La Land. It got 7.7 from okay. us. Um, Alright, so is that it? I think that's it then. Thank you for listening, and if you enjoy the show, then do please help us promote it by rating and reviewing us on iTunes. And feel free to go to facebook.com forward slash diminishing returns podcast, where you can comment and chat to us about all the films that we discuss. The Oscars ceremony is on the 4th of March, which should be this Sunday if you're a prompt listener, and we shall return next Monday with our latest trip into the Bond franchise. Diamonds are forever. <laughs>